Hey Siri, text my artificial pancreas, hashtag speaking. I just sent a text message around the world and down to the artificial pancreas I have clipped on my hip. However, this talk is not about the fact that I texted my pancreas, as cool as that may sound, but it's really about finding out what's possible when we decide to stop waiting. For context, I have been waiting for a cure for type 1 diabetes for almost 15 years. When you're diagnosed with diabetes, you're often told a cure is five years away. That hasn't happened yet. And what I didn't know until I became diagnosed is what a lot of people learn when they're diagnosed with a chronic disease. There's no way to prepare for it. You just have to learn to deal with it. It's like being struck by lightning. It's incredibly hard. There's no way to prepare. And in the case of type 1 diabetes, it's fairly complex. It sounds easy because you take insulin if your body doesn't make it. However, there are many things that drive your blood sugar up and many things that drive your blood sugar down. Some of these things, like insulin or the food that we eat, you can measure. However, things like stress, sickness, excitement, adrenaline, jet lag, it's really, really hard to count. So imagine somebody who drove or flew around the world to get here and is jet lagged, but they hiked 20,000 steps yesterday, and oh, they woke up with a cold. How does that impact what they need to do today? And that's my case, living with type 1 diabetes in that scenario. It's very, very hard, and it's made more challenging by the fact that the tools we have, the insulin that I use, isn't perfect. It doesn't work instantaneously. The insulin that if I were to give myself insulin right now, it's going to take 60 to 90 minutes to really come into effect in my body. Okay, you can plan for that, right? We'll throw in the complication that the food we eat may impact our blood sugar in 15 minutes. So you're trying to combat something that hits in 15 minutes with a drug that will really be effective in an hour. That's really hard to balance, which is why often people with diabetes that have graphs that go up and down, because we're trying to do things now based on things that happened hours ago or are going to happen in the future. It's hard. Now, there are tools that can help. I am incredibly fortunate because I can afford and access insulin, and that's not true for everyone. And I also have tools and technology to help me. I have the insulin pump on my hip that gives me insulin regularly. So instead of having to do injections multiple times a day, it gives me insulin throughout the day or when I press a button. I'm also very lucky because I have a continuous glucose monitor where it reads my blood sugar reading every five minutes automatically instead of having to do a finger stick. But these tools are not perfect. You still have to deal with the food, the exercise, the sickness, everything that's going on. So a person with diabetes, if they have a glucose monitor graph, it oftentimes looks like this, even if they try incredibly hard and they do everything right, things still go wrong. Things are still very, very hard. And the other reality is people with diabetes, especially type 1 diabetes, are also at short-term risk of dying if they end up with too much insulin in their body or their body is made sensitive because of excessive amounts of exercise. The preventative measure is to use a glucose monitor, and it has an alarm on it. However, you only alarm when you cross the threshold of one of those lines, and it begins to alarm. During the day, if this goes off, not a big deal. I stop what I'm doing, I deal with it. However, what do we do every night? Everybody in this room, you probably go to sleep. And that's made challenging for people with type 1 diabetes because your blood sugar is still going up and down, up and down while you sleep, and you rely on this alarm to wake you up. Now, in my situation, I am possibly the world champion of sleeping deeply. I sleep really, really well, which means that this device, when it's on my bedside table and it alarms in the middle of the night and says, your blood sugar is low, do something, I sleep through it. And I asked the manufacturers for years, hey, I have a problem, can you fix it? Make these alarms louder. And the responses I got back ranged. I was told, well, it works for most people, or it's not that big of a deal, or changing the alarm is a trade-off in battery life, or it'll take years before we get the next device with better alarms through the FDA or whatever regulatory body, which was incredibly frustrating because that night, I had to go to sleep knowing that I was not going to hear the alarm. 
And I thought, you know, if only I could get my data off my device, well, I don't have to use their device to make an alarm. I can use my phone, my computer, to make these louder alarms. And for a while, I thought, well, that's not possible. I have no way of doing that. But thanks to Twitter, I stumbled across a picture from somebody who figured out how to do just that. He figured out how to get data from the devices in our pockets and put it up wherever it needed to go. So I was able to take my data and send it to the cloud and send it to my phone immediately. Just like I texted my pancreas fairly immediately, I'm able to get my data to my phone almost in real time, and I was able to generate louder alarms. But because I have freed the data, I could also share it with the people who love and support me, even if they live all the way across the country from me. So we built a web page to display my blood sugar information so they could see what was going on. However, they don't need to get every single alarm. So I talked about that static line where if you cross that line, it alarms. But oftentimes, your blood sugar will bump up and down, 79, 81, 79, 81, 79, 81, which means the alarm goes off over and over again. They don't need those alarms. They just need to know if there's a severe alarm that I'm not waking up to. So in order to accomplish this, we added snooze buttons. So if I did wake up, I would press the button, and it would shut the system up for everybody else. But if I did not wake up, it would alarm them, and they could pick up the phone and call me and tell me, hey, you've been sleeping very deeply, wake up and do something about it. And that system worked really, really well. But because I was inserting data into the system, we realized we could actually create an algorithm that looked into the future, not just what's happening in this moment, but based on what you're eating, based on the insulin that you've taken, here's what's going to happen into the future. And we realized we could do even more with that same insulin pump and that same continuous glucose monitor and our algorithm, if you add in a small computer, a radio stick, and a battery, you end up with an artificial pancreas. It wasn't that hard because we had made small steps and small additions to the system over time. And I have to tell you, going from manual mode with diabetes to living with a closed loop artificial pancreas is amazing. The flat lines you see at the top of the screen, that represents 10 or 12 hours of deep, beautiful, uninterrupted sleep. And the picture of me on the screen is how excited I was to have this system. Because you see, we designed it for overnight use, which was my biggest problem, sleeping through alarms. It was all about regulating blood sugars at night. But it was so good, I didn't want to leave it at home when I went to work or I went out to dinner. So I lugged it with me everywhere that I went. And you can see even our first prototype used a Raspberry Pi computer and a radio stick, and it was kind of big. But you know what? It was worth carrying a larger bag to have this artificial pancreas. But as life-changing as it was for me, I knew that I didn't want it to just be for me. And so we, together with the people who helped us build the system, created a movement called Open APS, which stands for the Open Source Artificial Pancreas System. There's no company, there's no organization, just a community of people who have come together to focus on getting this technology available to more people. And as of now, there are over 341 people around the world who have built these systems, which means we have close to 1.5 million hours of real-world experience with this technology, and it's absolutely incredible. And I want to share three lessons I've learned from this community that's building artificial pancreases for themselves. And the first one, and possibly the most important thing that I've learned through this process, is you don't know what you can do until you actually try. When people hear about OpenAPS, one of the first questions they ask me is, well, what's your background or your day job? You must be an engineer or a developer or a programmer. And the answer is no. I'm not any of these things. I'm not a rocket scientist. But I'm also not unique. I'm just somebody who deeply understood diabetes and knew, hey, here's maybe how we could apply technology to solve this problem. And every day, as people learn and join the community, I'm reminded of this quote of Henry Ford that says, whether you think you can or you can't, you're probably right. Because people come in and say, well, I don't have technical experience. Surely I couldn't build this. And I say, yes, you can, if you think you can, and if you have the willingness to try. Which brings me to number two. Anything is better than nothing. Anything is better than what we had before in terms of living with diabetes. And the other reaction I get from people when they hear about open APS is, well, it's not a cure or insulin is still really expensive, how could we possibly expect people to do this? Or we can't expect everybody to do this. Or 
it's in clinical trials, right? There's a commercial device coming to market. And these people are all right. However, the difference in our community is that we've decided that we are not waiting. We can't wait. We can't go one more night at risk of dying in our sleep, of worrying our families and friends, or having one more day when things could be better. And finally, I've learned that pay it forward is a powerful magnifier. Because you see, I mentioned this is an open source project in a community. There's no company. Everybody has day jobs. We do this in our spare time because it's helped us and we want to help other people. And we get so much more done when everybody helps how they can, when they can. It might be five minutes here or an hour there, but those minutes add up to an incredible amount of difference. And it can be anything from answering questions to somebody who is new to the community and the concept of OpenAPS, testing code that's been developed by one of the developers in the community, fixing and improving the documentation that tells people how to build the system, and also helping build new features. Because the system I started with almost three years ago is very different than the system I wear today. So the three things I've learned is you don't know what's possible until you can try. And that is not just of diabetes, but that's about anything you set your mind to. You can certainly do it if you're willing to try, try again. And also, anything is better than nothing. Don't let yourself be dissuaded by people who say, well, it's not enough. It's not everything. It's not the cure. It doesn't have to be, but anything is better than nothing. And finally, Build a community so you can leverage the skills and the tools that everybody can bring to a project where you can work together to achieve little bits of change that add up to quite a big difference in people's lives. Because at the end of the day, there are infinite number of possibilities for what we can all accomplish when we decide to stop waiting. So my final question for you is to ask yourself, what are you waiting for? Thank you. <laughs>